So I'm going to, going to take the, the MC's prerogative to ask you a question that I have burning in my mind is, um, what is a crypto kitty <laughs> and can it save the world? <laughs> um, crypto kitties is, 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 is one of those concepts that are a little bit like Bitcoin. If I'd seen it back in 2013, I would have just like dismissively said, what a waste of time and money and effort and so forth. I love CryptoKitties. I think it is a really interesting expression of where we're at right now. CryptoKitties is um, a, a, a smart contract based um, digital art program that happens to be around a little cartoon image of a cat. And the point is, remember I talked about digital assets and the idea of a unique digital asset. Well, you now have a unique digital cat that you can buy and own and trade in the same way that you could own a Bitcoin. But it has this form that is based on a smart contract that's tied to the Ethereum blockchain. Ethereum's another form of blockchain um, that you own. Now, what's interesting is they, then, then you have, and it's unique, there is only one way this particular cat can look. So this is this idea of a digital asset. And then the other one is there's another one that's also unique and quite different from this one. But you can trade with them and they can breed and they can create new crypto kitties. And so there's this Merkle creature structure, this cryptographic you know, tying, and it, through whatever algorithm, comes up with something unique, right? And of course, this seems pretty frivolous, because, but we all know the internet was built on cats. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's <laughs> an actual truism. So I actually think on that level, it's very important. But it does seem pretty frivolous. And for now, there's not a lot of, not a lot of great use to it, but a, but a mutual friend of ours, in fact, has just shown that there is a pretty interesting use case. He's interested in ocean conservation, and he created a turtle kitty called Juno. Is that right? I think it's Juno. I think so. Yeah. And, um, and he, they auctioned it off. And so, you know, philanthropists and other people who are interested in ocean conservation bought this crypto kitty, and it raised money. Now, what's interesting about it, it's unique. You own this unique collectible, but it's in digital form. So, of course, you know, there's not a lot of practical uses other than that one, but it's a very, very interesting expression of what the future might look like. Because if once we get this scalability problem going, and the bottom line is CryptoKitties was just, it basically you know, used up the entire bandwidth of the Ethereum network because it's, just, the Ethereum's not developed to be able to have, people got so excited that it, it couldn't handle all of that throughput. But people are working very, very hard at how to scale everything. And once we do, I think that one of the most interesting things that's going to emerge is how we actually create unique digital assets and how we use that as a way to, for artists, all creators of all sort, to monetize their work, to work out how to collaborate with each other, to do a lot of things that you weren't able to do previously because you had to go through the record company or whoever else who, would, who since you had no choice, you had no way to directly engage with your audience because you couldn't sell them a unique asset. You had to rely on them to be the intermediating third party ledger keeper, mm -hmm. right? So this idea has at its kernel um, the future of what we're all going to be doing, I think, in some point when you know, the robots take over. We're going to be creating things. Uh, um, and, and hopefully there'll be some sort of you know, fairer way in which the, the wealth of that is shared. But it's going to have something to do with this you know, concept that CryptoKitties is based on, art as a unique digital asset. Mm, interesting. So uh, we have got some questions here. And one of them, I'm just going to pick a couple here, uh, is from, uh, and it's relating to an education application for for blockchain. So Connie Price is uh, making a statement here, really, it's awarding of qualifications is another example of an asset that embeds trust and this could benefit from blockchain. And this is part of the conversations we've been having this week is how could a university implement blockchain to, to incentive students or to uh, perhaps put in place an accreditation system. So what about some comments on, on Yeah, that? sure. So I'll, I'll do a shameless plug, well, not just for Curtin, but for the other university to which I'm tired, and that's MIT. There's a, there's a protocol, an open source protocol that was built on top of Bitcoin initially and is now being used on top of other blockchains called BlockCerts that came out of the MIT Media Lab where I'm based, and it was associated with the Digital Currency Initiative. And it's, um, yeah, it's this idea that you can now log into a, an immutable blockchain, uh, the record of a student's performance at a university. And MIT itself has now been putting its transcripts into this environment so that, you know, 
Kenya had an election a while ago. So I hate to keep picking on poor old Kenya because they're actually one of the great innovators of Africa. But they had an election recently, and I, I don't know how many, 70% of all of the candidates had said that they had Harvard degrees. And somebody went and looked at it all. Of course, <laughs> they didn't. A lot of Harvard um, graduates. So there's a, there's a real value in being able to prove. And universities' brands are completely connected to that, right? If you undermine and diminish that, then the brand of the university is diminished. And so there's something quite interesting in that. Now. Hardcore cryptographers will tell you you don't actually really need a blockchain to prove that a transcript exists. You could just sign it cryptographically and the university could signature could be recognized through a process. But what becomes really interesting about putting this into a blockchain context is it becomes potentially quite portable and it can become this, that, that piece of the certification can be amalgamated with other aspects of your, your identity and other things that you've, you've formed to, to get to this whole self-sovereign identity idea. Um, so it's, it's the foundational layer of self-sovereign identity that makes, I think, the certification process interesting. And then, of course, there's this new interesting idea that really we don't necessarily just need or want to see what somebody's degree is, but what other achievements have they made through life? And how might we get this sort of micro certification and, 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 and f smaller qualifications that might come from an apprenticeship or anything like that? And that starts to become really interesting because you don't necessarily trust what the Sparky is saying. You might trust Curtin, right? So that lack of trust then becomes something that may need a blockchain. So there's, there's certainly a lot of interesting work that's going on around this, yeah. Okay. So just turning, and there's a couple of questions around this in here as well, uh, turning to the, the the operation of the blockchain, this issue about energy use. So that's something that a lot of people have expressed concern about. Yeah. Is, is the use of energy getting exponentially larger as the, uh, as the, the in the Bitcoin area, as, as the trading grows? Or how does that work? Are you explained yeah. this to me the other, yesterday? OK, so, 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 so whether it's so much trading, but actually the uh, hashing power in the network. Um, the more miners, the miners are the computers that engage in this permissionless environment, uh, the more they see value in participating in this, and that's often dictated by the price of Bitcoin or whether they believe in Bitcoin, because that's how they're rewarded with Bitcoin. Uh, the more c computing power is brought to bear within this really important cryptographic puzzle that every computer needs to, part to do to prove that it is you know, doing something honestly. The idea being that it's um, very, very expensive to do that, right? You, once, well, it's increasingly expensive. It costs you electricity, it costs you computing resources. And if you had to do, you know, if you wanted to take over the network with thousands of computers, then it would be thousands of times all of that computation. So that's the genius of the system. It's called proof of work. But yes, what it does is, as there are more and more computers coming into the system, it creates this kind of arms race, bigger and bigger machines, more and more electricity. And as a result, you know, the, the Bitcoin network, by one measure, is, is uh, consuming as much as Austria. Now, I think that's, from what I've seen, is, 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 is this a I can't remember what the name of the web website is that does that, but there's been a lot of criticism of that. There's a lot of assumptions about what the actual efficiency of each of these machines is. Um, and that's a real concern. I think it's, it's naive to say this isn't important. But as I said before, you do need to have an apples to apples conversation around this, for one. That's the first thing I'll say is that, you know, I, as I say, I think it's naive to say that, that that's not a problem. We need to deal with the inefficiency of energy consumption within Bitcoin, without a doubt. But we also need to think about what it is, what baby we might be throwing out with the bathwater if we're actually solving. I mean, there's an enormous amount of energy that gets spent to maintain the existing financial system. Uh, that's one thing. But the other thing I think that's, that's really important is it's a free market system. Um, you know, Bitcoin miners are going to go where the energy is cheapest. That, that's it. That's the bottom line. It is really basic. Um, and now, the cheapest energy in the world, we've seen this in, in uh, I mean, Dubai you know, signed on a massive contract at 2.4 cents a kilowatt hour. And I think in some parts of Mexico, it's down to 1.7. The cheapest energy in the world is renewable. So Bitcoin miners are going to sort of gravitate towards renewables. Um, and uh, they're also potentially going to incentivize you know, uh, innovators within the renewable energy space to provide this service for them. 
that might mean that they displace the rest of us from the renewables and we end up using coal, which isn't necessarily a good thing. But the point is it's not static, right? We need to think about how all this is coming together. The other point I'll make, though, is that, again, what's also not static is all the innovation going around alternative ways to prove the integrity of the system. And there's a thing called proof of stake. There's a thing called delegated proof of stake. There's a whole range of different proofs that, in theory, wouldn't use nearly as much energy. And Ethereum is migrating towards this system. Uh, there's a lot of different things that can be built into protocols, post-Bitcoin protocols, that, that don't compel as much energy use. And maybe that's what the future is going to be built upon. I don't know. Again, it's just a case of, you know, it's not static. There's a lot of change going on. And this problem is, is front and center. So, so what about that issue of scalability? And uh, You've talked again this week uh, about, I think it's the, called the lightning layer. Mm. So tell us a little bit about that. How, how does that solve some of these problems of scale, of operation, and, and yeah. the energy problem somewhat? It's, good that you, I mean, it's called the lightning network, but the word layer is actually really important in this because um, it's a little bit like the way that the internet itself evolved, where you have this base protocol, TCP. Who knows what, I love doing this, I'm sorry, but <laughs> who, who knows what TCP IP is? One, two. I'm at Curtin, so one would hope I'd see a few more hands than elsewhere. That's, that wasn't bad, but it was definitely a minority, right? Transmission control protocol and internet, internet protocol, the two paired protocols that are the foundational layer of the internet. So, you know, people often ask me as well, by the way, like, when am I going to see a blockchain app? I say, like, well, you know, show me your TCP IP app. Right. It, it, it's, it's an underlying technology. It's, it, it's, it's at the base of everything, and we need to remember that, right? But what the t TCP was the, was the pro base protocol, TCP IP, and then you built other protocols on top of that, SMTP for email, HTTP for, uh, for World Wide Web. Um, and, and when those things came along, thing, big things happened. And one of the reasons why they had to happen was because the TCP IP layer was really limited. It just did one thing. It allowed packets of data to, to be switched around the world in a decentralized way. But it didn't do anything else. So you had to develop the applications to, to act, and, and these other protocol layers above it to, to enable all these really cool things that we now take for granted as part of our internet world. I think something similar is happening here with Bitcoin. Basically, we have this, and it's, again, I keep on using Bitcoin, but Bitcoin's the best way to describe the problem. Um, seven, seven transactions a second clearly is not enough. So some people think we should change the protocol. But that's become really contentious because there's money involved and nobody wants to change. You know, nobody wants to throw out what they have and it's just a massive, massive fight. So some folks, including a guy called Craig Wright, who's an Australian that uh, seems to claim that he's Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, has, has sort of instituted an increase in the block size to, to increase Bitcoin's capacity. But lots of other folks are saying, no, keep this thing really limited. So seven transactions a second isn't bad. In fact, it's, 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 it makes it very, very secure and therefore push the innovation up the stack. So Lightning Network is the, is, is the first and most important new implementation of that. And it essentially, um, it moves the transactions away. So no longer that every single transaction has to go through a Bitcoin block. It, there's a layer up above in which you and I can transact and then we can create a hop. And so other people can, can, tra I can if I want to send money to somebody else that you're connected to, you'll pass it through. And cryptographically, it's all tied together so that we know the roots come from an initial Bitcoin transaction. And then if one of us wants to close out the transaction at any given date, we could do so. So we have this anchor of trust in the system and we, we remove everything up to a much more lightweight model. And there's absolutely no restrictions on how many transactions you and I could do because it's just computing time. It doesn't need all of that heavy, heavy blockchain proof going on. It's just you and I, right? So it's a little bit like, you know, money being exchanged in cash and at some point being deposited into a bank, right? So I, I suppose there were one of the responses to that, though, is that, that aren't you then in, inserting a trusted intermediary into the, into the process somewhat and... Well, well, this is trying to have your cake and eat it too. Everything's a compromise, right? This is the near... Because the one solution is just to say, yeah, we'll just go back to trust, to entirely trusted institutions and we'll have Coinbase or somebody else, some of these institutions, they will essentially control our money and then they'll, they'll be the ones that on our behalf will, will make the transactions. This is different. This is you and I entering into a, into, into a specific type of smart contract with each other that we both agree upon and that's now in a decentralised way being lifted up. There is the fact that all those future transactions, you and I have to trust each other, but we've kind of established that. And that's the way the world works. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about Lightning Network is a much more honest recognition of the way the world is. But it's also much more secure, because you still have that 
that anchor of trust in, in, in Bitcoin. So it's a compromise, yes, but it's a tiny compromise mm. for an otherwise really pretty cool and efficient way. We still don't know if it works, by the way, and what might happen is that the only way to make this thing efficiently work is that new centralizing hubs will emerge, so there'll be kind of bankers inside the Lightning Network, and that may not be a great thing, but it, it, this is an evolving process, and something what we're calling the layer two solution needs to happen to enable this thing to scale to the level that will matter to the world as a whole. Okay, so you mentioned in there uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. Oh. Who, who, who is, is Satoshi Nakamoto? Do, and I was just why, asked why this question think, in a TV. Why do you think that uh, they've re remained anonymous? What's... I'm more interested in the second question than the first one. I was always told by my editors at the Wall Street Journal the thing that they, for a while when I got very cynical about the, the coverage of Bitcoin was like, go find Satoshi. I was like, there's really interesting things to write about about the technology and just forget Satoshi. But so we spent hours trying to find out who he was and it was, it's a goose chase. Um, uh, so maybe, I'm not going to say. Maybe just an explanation of who he is. So yeah, so, but I think what's, what, that's why the goose chase is, why the goose chase, right? Why did, he, why did they make it so hard? And I say they, because I tend to think that it's most likely a group. And I also think that they come from, if not the actual group, they are certainly of the tradition of a group called the Cypherpunks, which was a, a bunch of cryptographers who emerged out of the Bay Area and in, in, in the West Coast um, and really had a lot of these early cryptographic ideas in the early 90s. They're, that's the genesis of whoever Satoshi Nakamoto is. Why would you create it anonymously? Because, because you had to secure the genesis moment, which sounds really kind of uh, uh, highfalutin, but um, at any given time, and this is why the FBI has been really interested in who Satoshi Nakamura is, there's always, so the, the, the concept of the trusted third party breaks down in a way when we go back to who began the process. Because that's the initial moment in which, you know, truth was there. Now, this person obviously was also going to get, if, they, if the system worked, was going to be quite wealthy because they'd be the first person participating in it. So they're a target, right? Um, but just, just broadly, I think that the, the very concept of how we, somebody might bequeath to the world a protocol that is truly open source, that everybody else is working on, kind of needs that detachment. If we look at what's happening with Ethereum, and I, I, I am a huge fan of Vitalik Buterin, who's this 20-something genius who, at the age of 19, created this Ethereum network, and it's just an incredible concept, a, com a virtual computer that runs smart contracts uh, and, and becomes like a, you know, a, a global machine. Um, he's, everyone's always appealing to what Vitalik thinks, which isn't open source. There's always this godhead, and, and, and if we're looking for a model of, of kind of true decentralized structure, the anonymity of the founder seems to be important. I mean, obviously future blockchains won't necessarily be built on that foundation, but it, it, it's a great way to think about what the ideal might be. And I think that's one of the reasons why the anonymity is really important. So there's a, there's a number of questions in here that relate to the topic about what is the first practical application of block, blockchain outside Bitcoin and, and has, has the, the, the fluctuation in, in Bitcoin and, and the turbulence in that market somewhat tainted other applications? Where do you see the first uh, next? Yeah, next and look, problem? I mean, people, you have to hear people say, like, there's no, there's been no proven use case. It's like, yes, there is. Again, this is just not called blockchain or TCP IP, right? It, it's, it's the foundational layer of a lot of really interesting stuff that's already happening. So there are supply chain applications being built all around the world where you know, companies, so IBM's done a lot of the work, Maersk has done a lot of work, the big shipping company. You're seeing the port of Rotterdam, the port of Dubai, instituting blockchain-based customs trading. We're seeing trade finance solutions being done by banks everywhere where they register letters of credit and, and you know, these really important documents for imports into a blockchain so that you can prove uh, that you have rights to the goods in transit. Um, all of that's going on at that enterprise level, and I think that's all very important. Much of it is in this private blockchain structure. Um, what's interesting to me about the, the permissionless public blockchain is I think it's fair to say a lot of the, we call them dApps, decentralized applications, which are smart contract-based things built on largely Ethereum. A lot of them haven't really had a lot of traction um, as actual uses, whether, whether it's, you know, smart e-marketplaces or um, you know, the, the multitude of different uh, systems that these ICO developers have had. And we look at these ICOs, these initial coin offerings, 
and say, well, that's pretty pointless. It's all just speculation and hype. And we forget that it's actually the second use case itself, not the, not the dApps that, that, it, that, they, that they're looking to fund, but the actual funding process. And one way to think about it that I think is really interesting is it's the first idea market we've ever had. If you have a smart idea now, you have to knock on doors in Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley and say, what price will you, do you think my idea is worth? And a bunch of VCs who may or may not know you and, and have whatever weird relationships with you may or may not support you. It's not a very efficient market. It's an old boys club. Um, and therefore, lots of great ideas don't get funded. Uh, we've got GoFundMe and some of these other crowdfunding things, but they're very, very limited. ICOs are really interesting because here I'm able to say, here's a, here's a form of share or a form of security, whatever you want to call it. There's a whole debate about the legality of these things, but it doesn't really matter from a conceptual point of view. Here's a claim on my idea, and I'm not promising it's going to work or that the value that you buy it is going to be static, but I can promise you that this claim will be honored for the, the rights that are attached to it in this smart contract way, and it's worked, right? So, there's a parallel marketplace, a parallel capital market that has emerged alongside the traditional capital market. That's what the ICO market is. Hundreds of billions of dollars are being traded. That's a second use case, I think, right, in addition to Bitcoin. So stuff is happening, even in that permissionless world. CryptoKitties is another one, right? Because yeah. <laughs> I have got one question here is, uh, is the raffle ticket part of the blockchain? <laughs> <laughs> and no, it is not part of the blockchain, but we should draw those, uh, but it's, it's actually, you know, if you wanted provable betting, but there is actually one of the one of the early use cases. In fact, was betting on the blockchain because it, the, the house can't manipulate the results, right? So, yes, uh, raffles on the blockchain isn't actually a crazy idea at all. Ladies and gentlemen, look, uh, I think you'll agree a very practical uh, description of the blockchain technology. Please, thank you.